You know, the Amazon is seen as the lungs of the world, but we're now more seeing it as the heart, like the way it's like a big pump. But for me, it feels like a womb. Like it's so feminine. And she's like the feminine divine. She can be loving and caring, and she can also be harsh if you don't listen. So I very much see her as a, the Amazon itself as a sort of a live entity. Hey everyone, this is Annalisa with Journey to the Goddess TV, where I regenerate ancient feminine wisdom for modern women. Today, I am so lucky to have Zoe Tryon with me. Hello, Zoe. Hi, Annalisa. So good to be with you. I'm so excited. Yes, and she's in the Amazon right now, so we're, we're so lucky to get a sneak peek of what she actually does when she's doing it. So let me give you a brief introduction. Zoe Tryon is a renowned activist, artist, and speaker known for her work with indigenous communities globally. She is founder of One of the Tribe Journeys, a travel company that offers privately led, immersive experiences with indigenous communities in the Ecuadorian Amazon and Andes. Through One of the Tribe, Zoe has led journalists, filmmakers, celebrities to witness places in the world few will ever see. Zoe works to raise awareness for the issues facing indigenous communities and has acted as a cultural liaison between indigenous and Western leaders since 2006, when she first began living with the Achuar tribe in the Amazon. She has supported education, health, and economic capacity, building projects, advocated for environmental and constitutional rights, and worked closely with indigenous partners and the largest environmental lawsuit in history. She's ambassador for the Sacred Headwaters Initiative and for the Stop Ecocide Campaign. Great, brilliant. Thank you, Zoe, for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me. And it's been, we've been trying to have this conversation for quite some time. So I'm super excited to, to be here with you now. Me too, me too. I couldn't think of a better time, actually. <laughs> so we're just gonna dive straight into the questions. And the first thing I'd love for you to do, Zoe, is to give people a little bit of background into how you started working as an eco activist. I mean, I d never intended to be an eco activist, and I think that you know, no one, no one ever does. But it's sort of it's a sort of quiet calling that sort of happens over time. And uh, you know, I didn't sort of also set out to go and live in the Amazon. It was you know, when I was twelve years old in. Uh, in geography class when I heard about, you know, like many of us do, we're first exposed to hearing about the Amazon at school. And so I heard about the deforestation and, you know, horrific things that were going on. And I, and I was really moved by, by that level of destruction. And then, you know, from the age of 12, then when I went to study anthropology later on in life, because I wanted to understand more about indigenous cultures, because I sort of, over that sort of period, I was always drawn to the Amazon, but I didn't, I also didn't know anyone who'd been there or, you know, I grew up in sort of, uh, you know, a little village in England, and I didn't know people who were explorers or went and did those sort of things. So I didn't really think it was an a possibility for me, but I was always drawn to it. And uh, and then I remember at school, I read about, you know, in the careers guidance office, I read about anthropology, the study of humanity and study of different tribal cultures. And I was incredibly drawn to that. So I went and studied that and thinking that possibly that would be my way to get into the Amazon at some point. And, you know, that little voice kept calling me and you know, throughout my life, it took, you know, like many of us getting to sort of a breaking point uh, where that little voice becomes much louder. And, you know, I split up with my fiance. We had sort of our whole lives on track to go in one direction. And uh, and I split up with him. And then it was like that quiet voice was like, if not now, when? And I was like, wow, do you think I could actually do it? Do you think now I could actually go to the Amazon? And one of the things he'd said to me when we got engaged was, now, you know, you have to give up on your Amazon adventure now because I'm not going anywhere without air conditioning or Wi-Fi. And <laughs> I was like, that wasn't the reason we stood up, but, you know, that did contribute. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was at that point that I had this, this moment. I, I went back to England. We'd been living in Australia and, um, and I was praying and praying and, and, you know, doing my practice saying, you know, how can I be of use? How can I be of service? I knew I wanted to serve Mother Earth, nature in some capacity, but I wasn't quite sure how the best way would be to be. And, um, and it was in one of those moments and I had, a, you know, again, one of those turning points. It was like, you know, I looked up at the sky and I was like, you know, show me the way. And this remarkable set of coincidences, it's just unfolded one after the other, that was just mind blowing. Uh, like many of us have, when we get in, we get in that alignment where we become open and then universe or goddess or, you know, whatever you want to call it, higher power, 
sort of just gives you little pointers and messages along the way. And I ended up, uh, you know, going to Petaluna in California to take part in a training. And there I met somebody who invited me to the Amazon and I quit my job in order to go. It was so strong. And I sold the remaining shares I had. My mother left me some shares when, when she passed away. And it was, it was a delight for me to, I'd be like, here we go, mom, I'm going to sell them and do this crazy thing. I'm going to go to the Amazon. And I don't know what's going to unfold, but I'm going to trust because the coincidences are so remarkable. I'm going to trust and I'm going to, I'm going to leap. And I, that was my first trip to the Amazon with the Pachamama Alliance and a wonderful lady named Lynn Twist who invited me to join her group and go there. And then I met somebody there who invited me to, well, didn't invite me, but just said they were providing an English training course for the indigenous people in a very, very remote part of the jungle. And he said, you know, no one in their right mind would want to do that. And I was like, oh, well, I would. <laughs> and because I went there with the intention of living, if possible, with the indigenous as people and learning about what they needed and what my skills could do to support them because they're the custodians of the earth and I was like how can I support them to do what they are naturally doing and so I sort of went there very open and then it sort of it unfolded from there and I, and I took this this job and and uh which was very amusing because uh, I had no idea what I was doing I had ne- I didn't speak Spanish I, I didn't speak the local languages I had never taught before I was 32 it's when most people are sort of having children, getting married or cracking on with their careers. And uh, and it was there sort of that I just kept trying to learn to listen to the earth and listen to those that could listen to her. Um, and at that, and I, I lived for five months in the South Central Ecuadorian Amazon where I'm about to go fly into tomorrow. And uh, which is about, it's 110 miles from the nearest road. Wow. So you fly in a very small plane deep in. And, uh, and after I'd done that for five months and really deeply fallen in love with the jungle and her people, I went, I was invited to go to the oil fields in the northern part of the Ecuadorian Amazon. And there I sort of had my heart broken open by seeing the devastation and the destruction driven by us, our culture, by me, by my thirst for oil, you know, and, our, and realizing my whole life is awash with the oil, you know, the cars that I drive and the, the way that I fuel my house, the clothes that I wear, you know, and seeing the destruction that it had caused really, that was a really pivotal moment. And I, I just became very uh, committed then to doing whatever I could to to prevent more of that happening and to stand with the indigenous people who were speaking on behalf of Mother Earth saying stop this you know wake up you know they say that we're living in a dream world and that we in the west need to wake up and and listen to what the earth is saying so that was a very long monologue about how I came to be doing what I did just listening do you know what I mean just listening exactly i mean it's so powerful when you like when a person can listen to the thread of their life follow that thread listen to the synchronicities you will be completely led we were talking earlier about this connection between you know echo activism goddess consciousness divine feminine consciousness and and i would like if you could share how that manifests for you in particular in relationship to the amazon Mm-hmm. Well, definitely. I mean, I, you know, I grew up in quite a patriarchal culture. I grew up in the, the British aristocracy, which is not conducive to uh, the feminine, flour- the feminine power flourishing. And so for me, it's been a long process of sort of, of healing the sort of the wound of the patriarchy in my family lineage and in myself. And definitely by going into the Amazon, I felt for me, it was like, you know, I was saying this to you earlier, people see the Amazon as the lungs of the earth. Um, it's now seen also as perhaps the heart of the earth because of the, the rivers of water that are running. It's, there's double the water above the Amazon than there is in the Amazon, which is incredible. And it's this incredible sort of cycle and pump that goes on between the, the, between the, um, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific, the Andes Mountains, and the Amazon rainforest itself. This huge pump that sort of that powers weather systems all through Latin America and the U.S., and so it's seen as that, that sort of the heart, the heart of the world. But also for me, it was like, it was a womb. It was like, I felt that, uh, you know, in my own sort of life journey, career journey, and, and my own personal healing journey, with the steps that I took when I went back in, when I went to the Amazon for the first time, it literally felt I was being reborn. And I was to some extent. And, you know, she feels to me, you know, people you know, often referred to, you know, Mother Earth, Gaia, and the Amazon as, as a she. And it felt like I was literally going back into the womb and being like re, re-jigged. And, uh, and it's been an incredible um, journey, sort of 
going through that. I mean, the, the Atua culture that I spend a lot of time with, they are, they are pretty patriarchal, but you can see if you spend time, you know, a lot of my, when I lead trips there, a lot of the Americans are like, my God, you know, they're so patriarchal. It's like, yeah, but wait and watch and listen and see see that dance of, of power. And the women are very, you know, the, as we know, true feminine power is not in conflict with masculine power. It, they, they fit and they dance beautifully. When, when everyone is aligned, there's this beautiful sort of reciprocity and, and, you know, appreciation for other. And, you know, so I see that, I see in the women, the women, they, they make the chicha, which is the sacred drink that the Atwa drink. And the men are not allowed to touch it. They're not allowed to prepare it. They're not allowed to do anything with it. And you can see this sort of beautiful dance with, with that that happens between the, the masculine and the feminine. And, you know, women will take it, take a while and, you know, not listen when, when, when a man calls for chicha or, or maybe a fly will drop in it and she will not notice that, she, you know, because only she can take it out. And it's sort of, if you sort of, yeah, if you watch and you listen and you're open, and this is the same in any culture, you can see how the, the, the feminine is, is strong and is powerful. And, and what's been really beautiful as well over the last, um, how many years I've been working there, 16 years, is to see the rise of the feminine uh, in within leadership. Um, and that, you know, right now there's the vice president of the Atua Nation, who's a woman, and, and the last president was a woman as well. And it's like, and, and you know, the men have a deep respect for the, for the feminine, the feminine wisdom. And, you know, and I see that, Ecoactivism is is part of that. It's it's the women who are on the, on the front lines. You know, when I'm out there, you know, in indigenous marches, it's the women who are marching at the front. It's the women who have their babies strapped to their backs and on their chests, uh, who are you know are out there. When I was at the Inter American Court of Human Rights with the people of Sariaku, this incredibly brave woman, Enna Santi, who was there, who'd lost her husband in this sort of battle to protect their land. He'd been terribly badly beaten, and he died of blood clots in the brain nine months later, and she was. I think she had, I think she had eleven children at that point, and then David was the was the twelfth. Was born up just after her husband died, and she was there on the stand at the Inter American Court of Human Rights, breastfeeding her child. And you know the power in yeah. that femininity is it, just, you know, and and on the front lines always in every Indigenous part, it's the mothers because because the mothers understand what they have to do to protect their children. And for me as a mother now. I mean, I was late in the game, for any of your listeners watching, I was late in the game having a child because I was busy on the front lines. And it was later, 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 later. And then, you know, universe said, no, no, now, because you're getting getting on a bit, girl. Yeah. And yeah. So I had my daughter at 43 and she was just such a gift. And, you know, I'm so excited to be bringing her into the jungle now. But for me as a mother, you know, part of being a good parent and good mother is ecoactivism. You know, I, I want to create a... A safe place for my child to grow and so so the little tiny bit I can do to uh, to protect mother nature mother earth is is part of my mothering and it's part of my and being a mother you know sort of leveled up my eco-activism because it's like it, giving her good clean food and putting her in good environment it, you know and eco it's all one and the same for me would you say that your experience of being a woman being a mother being you know f- feminine divine feminine whatever that all of that means to you would you say that 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 the amazon has shifted that or changed that for you in some way definitely definitely i mean you know understanding you know my family of origin you know my father i mean literally lived two centuries ago uh you know in his world you know a good woman was uh blonde skinny quiet uh sexy and you know, like to good, like to drink. That was literally his perfect woman, and he was rather perplexed at uh, spawning me. And uh, and so I was always told, you know, I was too butch, I was too blokey, I was too, you know, big, I was too brunette, um, you know, and I wouldn't go and get the highlights done. Um, and you know, and and when I went to the Amazon, I saw these women who were incredibly feminine and incredibly strong and powerful, and you know, it, that that gave me sort of permission to be me in a way you know you can be you can be strong and you can be feminine because I think that was you know I found it in my own culture that was not really I mean it is it's changing now but you know particularly because my father was so of a previous century growing up within that sort of understanding it was it was hard and I'm naturally strong and I'm naturally you know want to be out there with you know I love being out there with my machete and yeah. going through the jungle and, and wearing my feather earrings and you know and, and they they the women of the forest do that so well and there's you know, there's power and there's gentleness within all of them. And uh, so they've definitely, 
they've definitely inspired me. And then, but also the forest herself, you know, she is utterly loving, gives you everything you need. You know, she's their pharmacy, she's their hardware store, she's their grocery, she's everything. She provides so much and yet she can be fierce as well and ferocious. And, uh, you know, I think that dwells within all of us and allowing all those different parts of us, you know, to be the mother and be Carly and be, you know, just to, to accept all those different parts. She's definitely helped me to do that personally. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I think that's probably a common, common description among indigenous communities around the world or, you know, traditional cultures that still retain their Mm -hmm. traditional beliefs, like Hinduism, Mm -hmm. for example, this concept of the, you know, life giving and life taking mother, just, you know, completely encompassing, encompassing us in her womb. Let's talk about more a little more specifically about where you are and if you could speak to just maybe some of the individuals or some of more about the Achuar tribe or some of the other communities you work with mm-hmm. well right I mean right now I'm actually currently in Quito which is the in the mountains in Ecuador and after this call I'm jumping in a in a cab I was meant to be in the jungle right now um, but there's been some some delays down there's an assembly that's happening so I'm flying in at dawn tomorrow so but uh, exactly after this call, I'm going straight down from the Andes down into Puyo, which is a frontier town. Then tomorrow morning, I'm going to fly into the jungle. And uh, you know, there's a lot go- there's a lot going on here right now. There's you know there's a lot of women's organisations coming out, which is so exciting. There's Mujeres Amazonicas, which is the Amazon women's organisation, which is becoming, which is doing great great work. There's a lot of uh, women activists who are sort of coming out of the jungle and speaking up on behalf of the forest because there's so you know, there's roads encroaching, there's oil encroaching, even though we know, even, I mean, I was just at COP26 in Glasgow and it was heartbreaking because there was so much wisdom there, you know, in the, in the events outside the main COP, there was so many indigenous peoples came, made a huge effort to get there from all over the world in the middle of a pandemic. There was such vision, such wisdom. And yet that wasn't, that wasn't being heard in the, in the halls of power, but what it sort of, what it woke up in many of us was like, okay, we need, to, we the people need to, to create this. And I think that's what a lot of the indigenous communities are doing right now. They're like, okay, they've they've had, particularly in Ecuador and Amazon, they've had contact for a couple of decades now and, and their understanding about, you know, our worldview and our culture and our way of doing things. And they're standing up and they're organizing and they're, they're getting their messages out there in a number of different uh, ways and means. And there's some incredible, uh, women activists, my dear friend Nina Gualinga, who's a young woman whose father's Swedish and her mother is from Sariaku. And so she speaks fluent English, Swedish, Quechua, Spanish. And it's just an incredible, incredible woman and mother. And people like her are really standing up and speaking up and, and a lot of different forums and getting the message of the forest out there. There was a terrible uh, loss earlier this year of Maria Tant, who was a Shua woman. Uh, she was called the Boa woman. She sung beautiful songs and I always get teary when I think about her. She was just an incredible, incredible woman. And uh, on the way home from a meeting of Mujeres Amazonas of the women's organization, uh, she was hit by a car, a hit and run and, and was killed. And there has been no justice. There's no one has looked into this murder. There's been a lot of death threats, particularly to women activists. And you know, you're vulnerable as a woman because you have children you have, and you don't have the physical strength. And so when, when Maria was killed and the police just didn't look into it. And we know why she was killed. She'd been receiving threats for some time. Patricia Gualinga, she's the aunt of uh, Nina Gualinga. She's an incredible activist. She had stones thrown through her windows and a lot of death threats, but still the sort of the, that quiet strength of the feminine. They're like, they get up and they get go back to the meeting the next day and they're back on the front lines again the next day because there's no other option. Right, it's that hashtag that nevertheless she persisted. It's that totally. Completely, completely. And there's no, there's no thought of backing down. And, you know, and I think once the, once the Amazon and once the earth gets into you, there's no question that you could, that you would ever just give up, give up. Do you know what I mean? And, and just the inspiration and the strength of those other women. And, you know, I do the little bits that I can and, you know, and I will continue to do that for the rest of my days. There's no sort of, there's no sort of signing off. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I saw some footage from the COP26 and I was really inspired to see all the, you know, especially indigenous young people 
And I mean, yeah. we know that about, you know, in the West too, that it's the young people that are stepping up and leading, leading us. Yeah, that was inspiring, even though it's, it's saddening to hear that their message isn't quite being heard by who it needs to be heard by. And that's, but I think that's, you know, so often in life, you know, it's this, you know, Margaret Mead, I think said, you know, never, never worry that it's a small group of people can change the world because that's the only thing that can. And, and I think there was a great group and I think there was 30 young people from, it was called uh, Minga Indikana. And so Minga is like, it's, I believe it's a Quechua word, which means communal work. And so it, when you're living in indigenous communities, the Amazon, they'll call a Minga, which is like this, you know, work to like, clear a runway or build a canoe it's it's work where you need the whole community together mm. and so someone created that they created this beautiful organization Minga Indikana, and it's indigenous youth from all over the americas are coming together sharing you know wisdom sharing visions sharing actions and they are strong and they're inspired and because they're young and they're you know they're a little bit more tech savvy than the elders and they're you know they're 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 visionary and they are sort of, and they're also there's also so many other, you know, Western youth who are who are involved in helping to amplify those voices. And I think, you know, the, the greatest thing that all we can, that all of us can do um, in the West is amplify indigenous voices, you know, in whatever ways we can and get their voices into rooms that they can't get into yet until they can. You know, and that's sort of, that's very much how I see my work. I, there's an amazing indigenous leader, Tom Goldtooth, who's the founder of the Indigenous Environmental Network in the US. And that's worth looking up if people would like to see how to su su support in the US. And I remember he said that to me years ago. He said, you know, you can, you can get our voices into rooms that we can't get into yet. And the most glorious thing for me was seeing um, at COP26, Prince Charles, uh, you guys will know, yeah, he's uh, our, the heir to our throne in England. He caught, he asked for a meeting with Indigenous leaders in Glasgow, and he sat there and he listened, and he really wants to support a lot of Indigenous initiatives, and Tom Goldtooth was in that meeting, and it was so fantastic to, to see him there, as were a lot of Indigenous leaders from the Amazon, and it was just really, I was like, yes, you know, like, the time has come now yeah. when uh, Indigenous voices are in exactly the rooms that they need to be in, and you know, and that, that, and I think in the West as well, or in the, you know, not necessarily in the West, but in the developed world, that, that, which is actually less developed in many ways. Yes. Um, we're actually learning to, as people sort of, they're thirsting for that connection. And for those who've still got a much more developed connection with earth and with nature and with spirit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, and that's the rise of, you know, ayahuasca ceremonies, you know, people sort of leaping into that because they're, they're thirsting for that connection with, with the earth and the direct connection with the divine in the form of Gaia right. and so you know it's really it's really fantastic to see and and we are in this great shift you know we're in this sort of awful situation in many ways but it's a time of great awakening as well and people are sort of beginning to realize that actually you know the way we're and we've heard about it for years and years the way we're living our lives and running our lives is not healthy in mind body or spirit for other yeah. individuals or groups or societies and the earth will kick back you know she will flick us off like little fleas off her back if we don't you know change in these recent occurrences and you know uh, uh, you know a testimony to that that you know come on guys wake up and I think this you know the last 18 months has been a time of great awakening you know I don't know in the states but in England we were gardening we were gardening in, in lockdowns you know yeah. and it was like in, in the second world war you know people had home gardens like what can you do back at home and grow a garden and, you know, the first thing that people did was they, you know, grew carrots for the first time. And the joy that that brought for people to have their hand, even if it was like a little tiny box on their balcony, you know, in cities, it's like people got their hands back in the earth. And, you know, that was really, really incredible to see. Yeah. 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 It was similar here. I mean, I personally just started walking everywhere. Yes. So, you know, yes. so, yes. Yeah, so I was able to kind of re-engage with my environment mm -hmm. instead of having to, you know, go go somewhere else to have an experience it's just like I'm in the experience but seeing spring happen for so many people hadn't you know and you could see that even on people's Instagram feeds it's like oh, look the buds because they did the same walk every day yeah. and if you do the same walk every day in your local park or your local neighborhood you see all the shift and oh the birds are nesting now oh and I've, and I've seen this bird every day or then it's just you know, that's, that's, that's the work. Do you know what I mean? That is it. It's like taking that time and to try and hold on to that when the work, 
when everything gets busier and busier again, it's like, no, that, that connection, that's when that still voice comes through from the divine, you know, in that quiet time in nature, you know, leaning with your back against a tree, mm -hmm. taking a couple of deep breaths, you know, that's when she comes through. Exactly. I, I want to go back to something for a moment because we were talking about women, especially activists, being vulnerable. Mm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the statistic is not just in North America, but around the world that one in three indigenous women are murdered and missing. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not sure, but, uh, but I'm sure that you've got the right stat, but it's, it's a lot. It's a yeah. great, it's, it's a lot. I mean, in North America, it's, it's horrific what is going on uh, with indigenous women. And, and, you know, they are much more vulnerable and, and definitely the same down here. I don't know the exact statistic, but that, that sounds like it could be correct. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure everybody is aware of that because it's, they, you know, indigenous women are one of the most vulnerable groups, not because they're weak, but because of the power structures at bay and the actors in the game. Totally. And the most important thing, again, we can do is, is support indigenous women's organizations right. and, and look for them and look for, you know, the, the indigenous peoples that, you know, that their wisdom speaks to you and, and find out about them and find out who the women activists are and find out how you can support them. And I'll um, leave links in the YouTube text box here yeah. and can continue to add to them. Fantastic. Thank you. So let's go on to the next question. Now, this is really interesting because there's been a new development, as you know, in the Donziger case. Yes. But I'd love it if you could somehow encapsulate what's happened uh, to where we are today and why it's important. Right. How do I do that succinctly? I know. So, I mean, so, so visiting the, the Chevron case, which the area affected by Chevron in northern Ecuador and Amazon was the thing that, like, broke me open. I went there in 2006 with Steve Donziger, uh, who's the lead American lawyer on the case, and he works with a lot of brilliant Ecuadorian lawyers, and a total Sultani, who's the founder of Amazon Watch, and Daryl Hannah. So we went in this little, like, group and, and went on a toxic tour to, to, of the oil spill sites, and it was horrific. So just to give you a quick overview, since 1919 in the US, it's been illegal not to re-inject what's now called formation waters, that's a PR term, it's toxic waste. So basically when you drill for oil, you bring it out of the ground and you have a separation station. So you get the crude oil and then you get these like toxic waters. And so, so since 1919 in the US, you've had to re-inject those toxic waters back into the ground where it's stable. So when Texaco came into Ecuador, there was no oil drilling here. So the Ecuadorian government said, you're a big American company, we trust you to do it right, um, go for it. And so they, they drilled and they chose to save a couple of million dollars by not re-injecting. So they left 937 unlined pits of oil all through this area, the size of Rhode Island, so a huge area. There was primary old growth rainforest where indigenous people, seven different indigenous nations had lived the time immemorial and they'd you know they'd thrive there and so you can imagine the contamination was horrific it it, it went through the groundwater it's the rainforest so huge rains these toxic pits flooded it into rivers into all the waterways contaminating everything uh, they end up in the uh, you also burn off toxic gases in oil development and that sort of went to the rains the rain was toxic and so the indigenous people and colonists who came there created a lawsuit against Chev Texaco, which was, and it was 20,000 people. Um, and that was then, because very quickly people started dying of cancer. And I mean, I, I won't go into all the horrific details, but you know, if children are drinking toxic water, the, the, de the deaths are, pr are yeah, pretty horrific. And, you know, mothers giving birth to stillborn, very distorted children. I mean, it's, it's just, it's beyond imagine. It's literally like the apocalypse when you go and visit there. And again, the mothers trying to protect their children and knowing the signs of bone cancer. And, you know, and I remember a mother saying to me, you know, we know this water is talking. I mean, you could see the oil slicks in the water where they're bathing, washing and drinking. And the mother says, you know, I know it's contaminated, but there's no other water. So I put lemon in and some sugar and I mix it up and I give that to my children. Oh my God. Knowing, and she had no other recourse. So, you know, and this lawsuit went on for 24 years. And Stephen Donziger was a young, brilliant environmental lawyer, fresh out of law school, bright eyed and bushy tailed. He came down there, he was horrified, he got super involved. And he stuck with that case through thick and thin. And Chevron bought Texaco and they bought the lawsuit and they knew what was going on. They bought it and they just 
we've got more money than God, we'll just throw money at it, we'll throw lawyers at it, we'll we'll slow the case down until everyone involved is dead, basically. And so that's how they slowed it down for many, many years. Finally, the lawsuit was won by the plaintiffs. And uh, and Chevron was ordered to pay up 9.5 billion just to clean up. That wasn't to pay for the cancer treatments or uh, anything else. That was just to clean up the land. They have refused to do so. They pulled all their assets, most of their assets out of Ecuador, but some have been found. And so this has gone on and on and on. And they, they then you know, decided to demonize Donziga, which they've managed to do in the, in the US. Uh, they had they used the RICO case, which RICO lawsuits, which so the RICO laws were created in the time of prohibition in the 1920s to go after gangsters. And <laughs> which is just insane. So they so Chevron used the RICO laws to go after the indigenous people in the Amazon, saying that they were extorting chevron and and, and there, there's a judge called judge kaplan in new york who is a, is a very corrupt judge he's got very close ties with chevron um if you go to at donziger.com uh, sorry at, at, you can go to freedonziger.com or to at steve donziger on instagram and you can sort of dig in deep and have a, a really good look in there um but you know this culminated in you know i mean on and on and on anyone who had anything to do with the case amazon watch uh, you know, I, I uh, went down to the, the Amazon with a, um, an amazing TV crew from Australia to do a piece on it. You know, I had my emails hacked into and published all online and, you know, she's... I mean, they literally went after everyone. They have 2,000 full-time lawyers on the case going after anyone and everyone. And Steve Dons again, his wife and child were, you know, absolutely bullied by them. And Stephen was finally put on house arrest for... A, for a crime of basically not allowing Chevron to look into his computer, his client confidentiality. And so he said no. And so that it was, he was, you know, he was taken as a contempt of court. Uh, the longest sentence you could have for that is six months on house arrest. Well, he served over two years on house arrest before finally getting put into Danbury prison mm -hmm. in the US, which is an overcrowded prison that he shouldn't have been in. And the big news is last night, finally, his supporters managed to get him out of there. So he's back on house arrest to serve the rest of his six month sentence on house arrest, which he shouldn't be doing anyway, because he's already served over two years. Right. But what Chevron has done is they've gone, we're gonna make an example of this man and of anyone else who stands up for mother nature. And you know, to scare every kid who wants to go and become an environmental lawyer, no one's gonna do that. You can come out of law school with huge you know, debts to pay, and then you could possibly get put in prison. Who's gonna, who's gonna become an environmental lawyer? You know, and so that's it. They very much are trying to make an example of him and of this case. And but the great thing is, again, it's a grassroots movement. So many people around the world supporting him. You know, he he had he wasn't allowed to practice law. He wasn't allowed to leave the house. He had his passport taken away. I mean, he's not a flight risk. He's got a wife and child. But they said he had great flight risk. But, you know, so many people have galvanized around him, you know, incredible activists and, and brilliant people have really stood with him through thick and thin and, and so this is a great win that he's now out but you know one of the, one of the other projects I'm very involved in excited about is the stop ecocide campaign because you know we see our legal system globally is not prepared to, to protect the, the forest you know we've seen that they the indigenous people won against Chevron and then Chevron's just tied up in lawsuits further and further they haven't pe spent a penny in cleaning up I go down there now it is still horrific there's oil seeping through the ground it's running off into the groundwater you know i mean it's really people are still dying of cancer it's like it's like how can this be so the, this amazing lawyer called polly higgins had this brilliant idea she went you know what the earth the earth really needs a good lawyer and so she went away and she she put she's an incredible woman she she mortgaged her house to work for the next 11 years to create an ecocide law so in the International Criminal Court, there's, there's four crimes against humanity, you know, genocide, crimes of aggression, and, and ecocide was going to be included in that, along with genocide, and it was missed out at the last minute. So there's this big campaign to get ecocide included again in the International Criminal Court. And what that would mean is that CEOs of companies like Chevron would be held criminally, personally, criminally accountable. So we need to have, you know, that kind of sort of law in place to stop future occurrences like this happening because you know even if you go to, even if you go to court you know so many huge lawsuits against oil companies they've never paid up they just keep it like wound up in lawsuits forever and ever and ever and so something like ecocide law would prevent future occurrences like this so we've got to fight sort of on both and you know and Gaia needs a law she needs to be protected I mean in in Ecuador we have uh, 
they were the first country to include rights for nature in the constitution. Wow. Uh, and that was fantastic. It, it's hard to it's it's hard to implement that. You know, we it's it's been now been adopted by many other countries. It's a fantastic idea. It needs to be, you know, rights for nature needs to be a thing. But also, I think sort of a deterrent, a very strong deterrent to those who are making money. Because the thing is, some of these corporations are making so much money, they don't care about losing a few billion. Right. Because they're making, you know, 26 billion a year. You know, it's like some of these pharmaceutical companies are making, you know, particularly recently, they're now making $80 billion a year. So it doesn't matter if there's a lawsuit or, you know, they have to pay up, you know, some of the, yeah, the, you know, these big, big corporations, it's like, it's just a, it's a little bit of a loss for them. Yeah. The profits are so great if they carry on doing what they're doing. So let's make it impossible for them to carry on doing what they're doing. Right. So again, the things that people, that individuals can do to help kind of further this mm-hmm. initiative all of these initiatives, everything, save Mother Earth, are... I think Amplify Indigenous Voices, you know, I think, and it starts personally, it's like, what are you passionate about? You know, I'm I'm passionate about the Amazon, but if you, what moves you? What, what, and then find out how you can get involved in that. And, and I think, but all of us need to look at our own personal impact. Like, I, you know, I'm an anti, you know, anti-oil activist, I guess, but I live in an old house in England, a mill house. The only form of heat that I get is oil. And that makes me sick. And I'm trying to do everything I can to change it. There's no, there's not enough sun in England for it, where I live for, for solar, but I'm like trying to look into that. But it's like we each of us individually can look at how we can change our own behaviors. But I think education is very important. And you know, Paul Hawken uh, wrote a book called Blessed Unrest. And I just love that that title, Blessed Unrest. It's really, really hard to look at this stuff. Yeah. It's really, really hard to feel the pain. But we, particularly as women, need to allow ourselves to do that. We need to stop you know, stop doing and feel it and feel that heartbreak about what's happened to the earth feel the heartbreak about what the future is looking like for our children and from that breaking open then and, and actually feel, just crying those tears then we can move into action because otherwise it can become so overwhelming I mean I know a lot of my friends and I know for me a lot of them I'm like oh god I, I actually don't want to see any more yeah like okay sort of hold yourself in that and go I know it's really really hard to to see this and, and you can do it, babe, and you can, you can see it and you can feel it and cry it and scream it and shout it and dance it out or whatever. And then, and then in that quiet space afterwards, move into action yeah. you know, and, and move into educating yourself further. And, you know, and really, and particularly today, you know, we know about the, you know, fake news, this news, da, da, da. you know, we're, we're intelligent women. Go and look at the data. I hate, I, I, go, I hate numbers. I hate data. Okay, well, you need, you need to look at it. You need to go and have a look at it. You need to do your own research and you need to sort of make your, you know, make some ideas about that and then to take some action. Right. And, you know, and even, you know, even though these corporations are incredibly powerful, get educated, find a group that's, you know, and, and, and get together and go out there and protest and make changes and make changes in our own personal behavior. And, and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, I, I get this sort of this feeling like, oh God, I, I'm not doing enough. I need to do more. You know, and I think that's what a lot of activists get. Mm-hmm. And again, sustainability has to start at home. You know, taking rest, t- that quietness, that, that, that sacred pause, particularly out in nature. You know, that's so, so vital. So that, that's, it's that balance, it's so, so important. And, and, you know, doing the best we can and then being gentle with ourselves. Okay, you've done, you've done enough now. Mm-hmm. Uh, not enough, but it's, you have done what is enough. Because right. you know, I, I might I've got to do more, I've got to do more, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And it's like, actually, you know, I need to have that quiet time, that, that connection with my, with my daughter. And I need to be an activist and stand up there on the front lines as well. Right. And it's that finding that, that balance and finding your sisters in that, who you can, you know, a, a beautiful thing I do with some of my girlfriends, we have a, a listening relationship where we, we say, you know, we'll text each other, do you, do you have, can we do five and five? Where we just listen to each other for five minutes. And if we got longer, we do 20 and 20, but we li- literally, you know, just bah, get it all out. You know, I'm feeling heartbroken. I do it with other mothers, you know, I'm feeling heartbroken for the world that my child is in. I'm, I'm feeling angry. I'm feeling, it's just like, and just be heard and listen to it. And that can really like let off that sort of feeling inside. And then you go out and you've been heard by a fellow sister. We don't offer solutions or advice. We just listen to each other. And then, then I can get up and carry on again. Do you know what I mean? So it's little things like that that we can do for each other. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, like, I think that is, that is part of the rejuvenating process, right? The regeneration. Yes. Is the, is 
the community and having a space to be seen and heard. I really like the emphasis too on finding both like what we can each do individually, but not trying to do everything. Because when you try to do everything, that's when it gets overwhelming and you just shut down. Right, it's just finding, committing to a few things that you can do individually and then join the communities, advocate whatever else you need to do out in the world. I know that you are taking another group, the Amazon soon. I don't know if you have more spaces this time around, but if you could share what your immersive tours are like, so if people want to join you in the future, they can know about yeah. it. Yeah. I'd love that, I'd love that. Well, I mean, these these trips were created because everyone's, my friends at home are like, what, exa- what are you doing exactly out there? And I used to help with a foundation that I used to work with Patrimon Alliance with a few of their groups, they'd bring down donors and show them you know, what was going on down there. So I created these trips for for friends and family initially to come and see what I do, but also to have a little taste of the experience that I'd had of going you know, into the heart of Mother Earth and of being with these incredible indigenous people who have such wisdom. And, and also the Atua have this sort of, this expression, they, they have a, something called an antique, which is a friend in an enemy culture. And so always if there's wars or any sort of discord, you, there's allies in other worlds that you can, and you always have free access to each other, which often then would create, you know, peace talks and all these sort of things. And, you know, seeing that what we are doing to indigenous cultures, I thought, you know, isn't it great to bring antics from our culture? So I, I'm, I bring in people into the jungle who have a sort of immersive, awakening, transformative experience of just being with indigenous people and being in this incredible rainforest and and learning to listen. And we do beautiful ceremonies every every morning. We do Wayusa ceremonies, which are these tea drinking ceremonies where you discuss dreams. We walk in the forest. We do ceremonies in the in the waterfalls, connecting with Aruta and the spirit of the forest. Vaku ceremonies, different lovely, beautiful, different plant ceremonies. Chirikaspi, Natem, you know, all these beautiful things. And and then the people go. People from this trip, they they have a personal transformational experience. But my hope is always that they will go back into their lives and into their world. And that's what you know I've been doing this since. I think I lived the first one in 2008. And it's really wonderful because the tribes that form in these journeys are just amazing. And then just to see how that's impacted people's work in the world or their, you know, when they go back into their lives is really, really gorgeous. So I I am super excited to, to lead this next one. It's January the 19th. There's two places left, actually. So I, you know, welcome anyone. And, and we just have a chat and decide if it's it, it's the right, the right fit because it's a sort of a tight little group and I'm going to be doing more of them because I just love them. I just, it's just such an honor to see people and you're, you're off screens, you're in the mid, that, that much nature all around you. Just, just being in the forest just shifts you on a sort of molecular level. It's just extraordinary. And it's just such an honor to watch people have that experience and to, and to have that experience again and again and again myself. Yeah. And then to, you know, to go back out into, into your lives, bringing some of those messages of the forest back out into the world. So I'm super excited to be doing that again soon. And yeah, I'd welcome any of your, any of your listeners coming on, on future journeys. It'd be wonderful. And you okay. need to come. I know I need to come one of these days. Yeah. Yes. I do. I really would love to, but I'll leave a link to that too as well. So I was, I was thinking as you were talking now, I mean, I was actively listening and I was, something came to my mind and that is for me, I, feel that like the best story, the most effective story for me is one that has the right combination of tragedy, comedy, but also contains hope. Mm -hmm. So in this story of the human drama here of our, you know, Gaian human drama, what hope do you hope to see? What is, what kind of hope would you like to see moving forward? Well, I mean, I think again, from, from the experience of being, around particularly indigenous peoples, they, they, there is such hope there. You know, there's, you know, even in the Sabra people who, who say we're going extinct, but we're, we're you know, because there's, there's three remaining speakers of the Sabra language left there. I'm very close with them. And they say, even though we're going extinct, we're, we're, our message and our wisdom is going out. And they're now teaching a lot to, you know, people in the modern world. And then you will transform and you'll take that message on. And they just see this transformation like anything else, like an evolution in nature. They'll, they will leave and become spirits. And they, they, I mean, they, they have a different sort of cosmological understanding than we in the West may do, that they become part of the earth again and part of the spirits. And there's no real death for them. Yeah. But I, you know, 
being around indigenous people is what gives me hope because they they are so resilient and they are so deeply connected with earth and 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 they know of her resilience too and I think that's you know when I'm when I'm in London or New York and I'm like oh my god you know how are we going to keep cope with this I, I can get very lacking in hope and very despairing at times and when I look at the future of my child I can get despairing but then when I'm around the indigenous people again and, and, and I just the, the hope that they have and the resilience that they have. I really believe as well, I really believe that every soul that's here on this earth right now at this time has chosen to be here. And we've chosen to be here for a particular reason and, and because we can, because we're strong enough. And even if we feel despairing at times, it's like, no, you you chose to be here. You've been chosen to be here and you are strong enough and you can get through this and you can be a part of the shift and the, and the, and the change. And that gives me, that gives me hope. <laughs> There, there she is. Hi. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> let's go to the jungle, Mama. Let's go to the jungle. Is this her first time? Yes, we were on our way. We were little hand. We were on our way to the jungle, and we were in LA on the way down when when the pandemic hit and the borders closed. So then we had to back to England. So we were meant to be going two years ago, but so now finally I'm, I'm getting to take her. Right. She gives me hope. Do you know what I mean? I like look at this bright, glorious little being who's just so curious and so in love with earth and nature and animals and people. And that gives me incredible, incredible hope. And that is, it's a future generations. Oh my God, what a blessing. I look forward to hearing stories. Oh, when... it's so exciting. It's so funny because she goes, mama, I really miss the jungle. I'm like, baby, you haven't, you haven't been there, but I miss it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you uh, would like to share or bring up before we close our conversation? No, I just, I just, I think, I, I mean, I just think to, just to reiterate that we, we are, we are here at this time for a reason. And I think for all of us to remember that and, you know, everyone on this podcast is here for reason. my love, I'm coming in two seconds. And remember the children, you know, be guided by our future generations so for having me. I'm so thrilled to have you here for you to share your wisdom and your joy and your energy is just so contagious, oh. contagious in a good way. <laughs> That's kind of a challenging word to use right now. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make contagious great again. <laughs> Yay. There you go. But so, it is, that's the thing. It's community. It's being with other sisters. It's like, we can do this. We can do this, you know? That's right. That's right. We can. And we need to laugh a little bit, too. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's why I say, like, a great story has comedy, too. Yes. I want to give you an opportunity to tell people how they can find out more about your work. And, of course, I'll leave the links. but if there's anything you'd like to say about that. Well, I mean, I, I'm on zoetrion.com and then one of the tribe journeys as well. And then Instagram, I don't use Facebook anymore, but I do Instagram on my Instagram. I sort of, I point people in the direction of in great in indigenous initiatives and, you know, what's going on in the Donziger case. So that's a really great way to, to stay in touch and to share any great things that you guys are doing so I can share them on it as well. Those Perfect. are the sort of best ways. I love that. Perfect. Well, I look forward to hearing about your journeys and uh, your stories and what's going on. So everybody stay, stay connected on Instagram to follow and follow Zoe there. And really just thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Mm-hmm. And thank you to everyone at home. Please subscribe. Please like this video. Please share it with people. Please, please, please share. Let's get the word out. Leave comments. That also helps to get the, the video circulating. Until Thanks. next time. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you so much, love. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.